Hi, I'm Dave Weckl. I play Yamaha. Um, well, Dave, it's such a pleasure to have you here. It's in Spain again. Um, how long has it been since you came the last time here? Yeah. I honestly don't remember. No? No, you're going to have to look that one up. No, have you ever been to Morcia before? Yeah, Just, I, I think so. Yeah. Um, I think I was here with Chick oh, okay. in the past, but I, I honestly... I honestly don't remember. My touring schedule is so crazy. Yeah, of course, of course, nonstop. I don't remember much. Well, first of all, we want to say thank you so much for this time you've given us, and we know that you've got a really, really tight schedule. And my pleasure. Um, um, it's an honor for this is this is the online TV show that is the biggest one in Spain. Right. I was, drums, wondering, I was wondering what this was. Missed, yeah. Mr. Online Drums TV. Oh, okay. Hi, and um, thanks to Lucas Jimenez who started it all. Yeah, cool. And it's become really big for drummers in Spain. Great. And um, anyway, this is just um, a quick interview to give them the chance to know you a little bit more. Okay. And. Um, First of all, I think what we would like to know is how you started. To play, uh, what, like, what was your schooling? What was your schooling for drums? How did you learn to play drums, and where did you learn a little bit of that? Honestly, growing up in the middle of America in St. Louis in the suburbs, um, really wasn't exposed to a lot uh, of music yeah. at a young age. So yeah. most of what I was attracted to was what I was hearing on the radio or, or you know, there was a lot of m music in the neighborhood though. My friends next door played and so I was, you know, attracted to that and I sort of always wanted to be a guitar player anyway. When I was young, um, nice sound effects. <laughs> um, so I actually, I actually started to play guitar first when I was very young, wow. six or seven, and wow. I, I didn't like it at all. Very quickly, I decided. No, well, we're happy about that. that. <laughs> so, um, but then it was really kind of just, you know, back then there was still um, music in the schools. Yeah. And so we had a band program, and I got involved in that. And my my next door neighbor was three brothers, and they had, the youngest guy was closest to my age, and. Um, and he was a drummer, mm -hmm. and he showed me a few things, and and uh, my dad, um, my dad got me a cheap drum kit, you know. Somebody answer that phone. It's a gig. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, and he got me a cheap little kit, three-piece kit, just a you know bass drum and a tom and a snare, and I, you know, and I used my mom's soapbox for the floor tom, and and uh, and I just started playing at records, rock records, and. This, this would have been when I was just about seven or eight years old. And I guess I was eight by the time I got the, the drum set. And, uh, and then my dad, you know, my dad was a, um, a, a piano player by hobby more than anything else. I think he, he would have liked to have really played professionally, but he, he didn't, he didn't, didn't, didn't pursue it. No, he didn't, he, was, he had stage fright. He didn't yeah. really like to be on stage. So. But he, um, uh, you know, he, he had a lot of great records, a lot of great Dixieland jazz records. And oh, great. Mainly with Pete Fountain and Jack Sperling was the drummer. So I, 
that was really my early education as a drummer, uh, learning about jazz was, was Jack Sperling with Pete Fountain. And then I was 11 or 12 years old, it might have been 12 after, after my, my next drum set for a birthday present. Um, I, I don't remember all these years exactly, but he bought me this, um, this gold sparkle Gretsch kit for my, I think it was my 12th or 13th birthday, but, but he brought home a buddy Richard before, you know, mm. and that was kind of, like, wow, yeah. that was the beginning of the whole, you know, uh, journey to try to figure out Buddy, and then that, that, that got me into more big bands, and then that led into Fusion, and so it was, it was kind of just a, a, a cycle. I, I didn't really take any lessons until I was about 12 or 13. Yeah. I just kind of learned on my own. The yeah. store showed me stuff. And, uh, self-taught, stuff, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, it was self-taught for a while, but then, of course, I, I, I got the lessons, and I had, I had a couple of really good teachers in St. Louis. Bob Matheny was the first teacher, and then he, um, he sort of kicked me out so I can't teach you anymore and got me to, uh, to get this uh, guy named Joe Berger. And between those two, they, they really helped to give me a very, very good foundation, you know, with reading um, technical stuff, although I have to say I did the technique more on my own, just by getting tips yeah, of, so. you know, and watching and copying and, yeah. and I don't know what you want to call it. But, and um, but but certainly Joe and Bob and, um, and I learned um, some finger control stuff from Jim Petersack and Roy Burns and, and um, you know from there it was kind of like I said it was that progression and when I was 16 I think I heard Gad for the first time and that that, mm. that kind of put me in a whole other direction and a whole other serious influence of wanting to. Uh, you know, to understand that, so it was kind of just complete obsession with Steve for a while, and um, and that you know that that was that kind of lasted through my high school thing. We had a really good jazz band in high school, so that that kind of kept the inspiration and the um, you know the necessity to practice, to read, to to learn the music, and to you know, and we were pretty much running the jazz band as a bunch of kids we were kind of always telling the director what to do so um and we were we won all kinds of awards and and, uh, and in fact it, it's a, you know through those competitions and the, and the performances that we did um i won a couple of scholarships to the stan kenton clinics which were in the middle of missouri and that's where i met tom kennedy actually who then introduced oh, wow. me to jay oliver so it was like a Oh, okay. Kind of a whole, okay. you know, yeah. if I wouldn't have grown up in the Midwest, it may not have turned out the same, who knows, but, but that was the journey and the path, and then then I went to Bridgeport, Connecticut for and college. And did you meet Chick Corea through, through no. Jay Oliver? No. No, 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 Chick was much later, I mean, I, I, I was in New York, um, I was already playing with Bill Connors and Michelle uh -huh. Camillo and doing a lot of different dates in town. I'd already done the tour with Simon and Garfunkel and I was already playing with a lot of other, yeah, yeah. other things. I do quite a bit of studio work in town. It was 85 when, when Chick was looking for the electric band drummer. And, and I happened to be playing in town with Tom at the bottom line in New York with Bill Connors. Who ironically, Bill Connors was the first guitar player in Return to Forever before Al DiMiolo. So it was, uh, so we're playing and I see Chick walk in and I was like, Wow, okay. And that was the beginning of the electric band. Wow, okay. Yeah, and it was because Michael Brecker uh, recommended me, um, and and I think Chick was hanging with Tiny Marie, and she was playing him a Michelle Camillo record, and you know, to, to say, hey, check out this piano player. Yeah. And and I was playing drums on the record, and Chick was listening to the piano, he says, yeah, it's great, but who's the drummer? <laughs> <laughs> so my name came up twice in one day, and then it, they happened to have a night off, and they looked in the paper, and it happened to be I was playing, so it was kind of stars aligned. Fantastic. So, you know. It was meant to be? Yeah. I mean, you know, don't, don't get me wrong. It wasn't like I was sitting around waiting for it all to happen. I was no. practicing you were, my ass off for yeah, that's, a lot that's, of time. That, that leads me to the next question. I know that you used to practice a lot. Yeah, you know? quite a bit. And 
something like maybe about eight hours a day sometimes? Well, I mean, it's people like to put the time frame on it to say, uh, you know, five hours, six hours, eight hours, ten hours, whatever, you know, a day. But, but um, I mean, yes, it takes time. I, the more you can spend, the yeah. more the more you can compress learning into a shorter period of time. And, you know, let's just say I, I always tried to practice the most amount of time as much I could, as you could when yeah. I was, you know, doing school and everything else. But, but it was really the summers off my, on my wow. first two years of college that I didn't come home. I stayed at the school. And, uh, and I had I had my drums in the school building and I had the keys and it was a brick building and there was nothing going on so I literally could go in at three in the morning if I wanted to and I did quite often I would I would just schedule my times and I didn't have anything else to do honestly I was working on weekends but it was really a focus of just you know I had just heard Steve get or saw him live for the first time um, in the in the winter of '79 and. So that first summer was a, was a huge period of real dedication, know, dedicated, yeah. full-on, you know, organized practice. Mm -hmm. And that happened two summers in a row, three months, you know, and it ended up being more like 10 to 15 hours a day if you want to put a number on it, but not all at once. Yeah. I mean, I would take breaks, so you'd three or four hours go go to the ocean, come wow. back, and, you know. Well, just, but it was a schedule, and it was a, it was a, um, you know, a very, I had to be organized with it. I wrote everything down. Methodical. You know, you know yeah. about what I needed to, to work on and kind of went about it as, as a job. Oh, great. Know? Yeah, yeah. All with the intention of getting, hopefully getting to a, a better place within New York City playing with, you know, all these players that I grew up listening to and wanting to play with. And that's kind of the way it happened once, once, Anthony, Je once I got the gig with French Toast, thanks to Peter Erskine, who recommended me, um, you know, I got that gig, and then Anthony was on the gig, and Anthony Jackson sort of recommended me for a lot of different uh, gigs, and, and that led to the chick thing, and that, you know, so it, it all kind of works that way, which really to say, you know, to the young players, it's like if you, you can spend your whole life practicing in the basement, you know, and getting really good, but... If you don't, if you don't get out there. If somebody doesn't know who you are and they can't hear you, and you don't get to play with people, it's you're, you're going to be a great basement drummer. You know? <laughs> yes. Maybe make some good YouTube videos, you know. But <laughs> but other than that, you have to you have to play you with have people. To play, you have yes. to get out and play. And, because that's part of the schooling, yeah. no? It's part. It's yeah. another another way of learning yeah. is playing I mean, with other. Well, I mean that's 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 as important yeah, as your individual as practice. You mm -hmm. have to you have to play with people because you, you have to understand the relationship of the give and take. Yes. You know, playing with somebody, it's not not just about you when it and it is when you're practicing. You're and would you say control. would you say that when you're actually playing with the other musicians, when you're playing with bands and you're playing with other musicians? Are you thinking about what you rehearsed, what you practiced at home, or what you practiced in the shed? Are you thinking I about probably that? Used, I probably used to when I was young. Um, I don't... Not now. I don't ever really do that anymore. It's, yeah. I try to live in a very spontaneous musical yeah. place to play what I think either works for the music at the time yeah. or what I might be channeling into the music. From exactly. Not so much what I practice, but what... The, the vibe I want to create, yeah. and it might be channeling another drummer. It might be listening, you know, referencing Gad or Billy Cobham or Stuart Copeland or, mm -hmm. or you know, uh, John Bonham for that matter, or Buddy Rich. It's not that I play the stuff, but I channel the, the vibe and I, channel, yes. and I I put myself into that mind frame, mm -hmm. and, and I, I'll go for something in that concept of mind, you know, and. And I mean that's what we all do, whether we like yeah. to admit it or yeah, not. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, of even, even Gad talks about channeling, you know, mm -hmm. thinking about other players when they play. So um, yeah, because but, everyone's been influenced by someone. Yeah, of course. But I mean, at the end of the day, it's that you you don't you don't you don't want to sound like somebody else. You want to try to play their licks, but but the channeling can really. You know, the yeah. idea is to put yourself in the mind frame and then play your own stuff. Yeah. Your own way. Because it's not the licks. I mean, I used to, I, like I said, when I was young, I would, I would kind of take more, more, um, a literal approach and, and think about applying, mm -hmm. you know, exactly what I practiced that day, which is, which is young. Yes. <laughs> it's a young thing to do. 
And that, um, and, and so then, what do you think about people? I'm sure you've probably seen a few drummers out there everywhere you go, because you, of course you've travelled the world, and you still really. are. You still are everywhere, but honestly, not really. I mean, to be honest, I mean, I don't. I, I'm. I mean, I hate to say that I'm, and sound so silly, really, that I'm so busy that I don't. Get no, to see no, other no, things, no, 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 that's I a fact. That's kind a of fact. So, kind of honestly am. <laughs> of course <laughs> I don't you don't really get to see... Many other drummers. Many other players, unless it's a festival but, or, uh, or yeah. if it's on YouTube. I mean, I see yes, the same thing YouTube. everybody else does. Yeah. And, and precisely on YouTube, maybe, have you seen, have you come across, like, a few drummers who are trying to sound like you, play like you, that Not have so learned your any. style, that have learned your chops? Because there's a lot of that that existed and um, yeah, have mean, you seen it what do you think of um what do you think about these that are trying to copy dave Wickle? well or? i mean it's i mean it's copying anybody i mean it's yeah. it's it's a it's it's young and it's we all do it we all go through that that phase of yeah mm -hmm. of just loving something so much that you want to copy it you yeah, want to sound exactly. like that you want to figure it out you want to analyze it you want to you know and it kind of, you know, it happened to me with, with, with a few different players that I, that I really studied hard. And it, not that I, not that I got to the place that I sounded like them or that I yeah. could play everything they played. It's not a matter of that, but, but I understood it. And I, yeah. I, I yeah. got, I got it. I, it was like, okay, so now let me stop thinking about them and start thinking about me. And yeah. What, you know. Yeah. And the problem is, is if you listen to just, you know, one player, one style. You're really narrowing, you of know, course. And limiting yourself to what is available and what you know. Because for me, that's the joy. It's the channeling yes. of so many different players and different styles in one song. Sometimes, you know, yeah. that, that it becomes, uh, um, you know, nobody knows quite where it's coming from because it, it's a mishmash. It's a fusion of, yeah. of a lot of different styles and, and people, and it becomes your own after a while. Especially if you start moving drums around and. Mm -hmm. You know, and just just placing things a little bit differently than is the norm. Yeah, you know, then it becomes can, more personal. It's I mean, for personal. example, in some bands, I'm not really I don't know what I'm going to do today because I haven't seen this drum set yet. But but sometimes I'll, I'll I've been recently playing the largest floor tom on my left, which you know ends up being a whole different melody structure, mm -hmm. and tonality because there's no way I could I could. If you close your eyes and listen to what's being played, and somebody tries to figure it out on a normal kit, they're never going to be able to. Yeah. Go, oh well, it must be sticking it left-handed, <laughs> you know, and this and that. And yeah. Unless you see it, and then you realize, oh, it's the left hand on the floor tom, but but in a in a structure of a single stroke roll or combinations, wherever it might be, the sound, the melody is different because the tonality is not what you expect. It's in a different place. Yes. It's on the, it's on the, the on that end of the kit. It's on the left hand, so the so everything changes. But so, that's one of the fantastic things about you. You're always renovating. You're always innovating. Yeah, you're always I just changing. Get, I get bored. You get bored, and, and I get bored. I like to change it around and make you know and yeah. do different things. And and, and quite honestly, with, sometimes too, it depends on the music. The music sometimes dictates, which is kind of yeah. why I started playing the left floor tom. I did a recording project for somebody that wanted a, a, a real heavy double bass pattern, and I'm not a double bass guy. I don't. I, mean, I can't play that stuff that well in the pocket and make it feel comfortable. So when it's a groove type of thing, so I just kind of went back to my old days of triggering the left hand, the floor tom, the bass drum with the floor tom, except with this big one. I just tuned it really low, taped it up, and it was, you know, it sounded like a bass drum. Yeah. And, and that kind of, um, and that kind of, uh, you know, um, got me into, you know, after I did the session and I, and I enjoyed it for that, application that purpose I started just messing around with it and I was really liking it you know, so I just left it I left it there for most things and like I said I haven't decided what I'm going to do tonight yet if I'm going to put it over there or the drum set would probably dictate what I'm going to do but great you know, great like last night there was no rack or there was no tom mount so I couldn't use two toms so I just had to use the 12 you know? oh okay and but, you were in Tarragona I think yesterday no Tarragona Barcelona Tortosa oh Tortosa what they called it. Yeah. At the castle. Was it fun? Yeah, great gig. Great good, first good, gig. Good. Yeah, I was just happy to get and through this. And this band? This band? Yeah, the same. Nomads is, you know, Chris Mendoki's uh, creation, kind mm -hmm. of uh, bass player from Denmark and New York. And, and George Whitty, great keyboard player, Dean Brown, you know, fun, fun group. Different, you know, I don't know how to categorize the music. It's kind of groove, fusion, 
not not so much fusion, but it's yeah. a mishmash of stuff. Yeah. But more groove oriented stuff, I guess. That's cool. I mean, you're, you're just non-stop with many different bands and doing your own band thing in your clinics, and you're just always non-stop. And, yeah, yeah, we. And, yeah, it's, it's boring to not work. So. Exactly. I know. <laughs> Keep I know going. how much you need Keep it, and, yeah. um, and that's it. the great thing because, like I said, you know, thank, thank God for that because we'll have Dave Wiggle for a long time. Yeah, well, I don't know about that. Uh, well, we'll, we'll, I really you know, think so. I really hopefully think the so. hopefully the body keeps going. Uh, that's, no, definitely. That's, uh, that's the most important thing. Is you the seem, health. you seem to get healthy. younger anyway. Over the years, you get younger. You go back the yeah. way. Yeah, I think. Uh, no, yeah, really, yeah. really. But yeah. um, when it comes to your sticking technique, um, as far as I know, you've You've changed your technique many times, um, depending on what you see or, or what you think a, a different approach in your sticking technique. Um, you've never stuck to the, the same technique for years. Well, not really. I mean, it's really still, you know, You're, my basic stuff that I learned a long time ago. But Freddie, back in the mid '90s, really changed. Uh huh my approach got me to really look at, at things and understand balance a little bit better and, and you know just ergonomics of the kit really became uh, evidently important uh, to, to really be comfortable and pull things yeah off, that's the main you know. thing though and it's just a matter of you know in in, in a very short synopsis because I have to go yeah. um, but um, it's all about the you know letting the sticks do a lot of the work and instead of pushing into letting them all come up and out. Yeah, so, the bounce, no, the bounce, the, the, re bounce, the, the rebound. The bounce, the, yeah, the, the grip points, everything, a lot goes into yeah. it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because well, we don't have time to get into it now. Um, yeah, well, yeah. thanks so much. And if you want to say hi to the, the TV show, Mr. Online Drums TV, whatever you want to say. Mr. Online Drums TV. Hi. Cool. Nice to be here. Thanks for, I don't know which camera to look at. I got two GoPros. And, uh, <laughs> anyway. anyway, thank you very much for having me and uh, have fun playing. I got to go. Sound We're going to come see you tonight anyway. So okay, great. Thanks so, so much. Okay, thank you. you.